We are alive. Three, two, one. This is Literary Roadhouse. One short story, once a week. I'm Anais. I'm Maya. And I'm Gerald. And this week, before we get started, I need to let everybody know that sometimes we get a little saucy in our discussion. If we do get a little bit of potty mouth, we'll let you know in the show notes and also in the iTunes rating. Please share with your children at your discretion. So this week, we're discussing Cathedral by Raymond Carver. If you haven't read the story and don't want to be spoiled, pause the podcast, go read it, then come back. So the story begins with a man who is not looking forward to hosting his wife's longtime friend, a man who is blind and recently widowed. The narrator has all sorts of stereotypical ideas about blindness. During the visit, the blind, the blind man, of the paragraph again, <laughs> you can cut it out. <laughs> During the visit, the blind man breaks some of the narrator's stereotypes, such as blind people always use canes and blind people don't smoke. After dinner, the narrator learns that the blind man, who is named Robert, has led a full life. On the couch, the trio watch TV and the wife falls asleep between the men. The narrator, who Robert calls Bub, tunes into a program about cathedrals. It occurs to Bub that the blind man may have no idea what a cathedral is. Robert admits that he doesn't really know what a cathedral is, except that they took hundreds of years to build and other facts that he just learned by listening to the program. He asks the narrator to, to describe a cathedral, and Bub realizes he can't do it. The blind man has an idea that Robert should draw it, that Bub should draw it, and Robert will put his hand on the drawing hand and get a feel for what it looks like. While he's drawing, Robert asks Bub to close his eyes. Bub d does, draws it with his eyes closed, and then realizes... Oh, sorry, I should do that again. It didn't paste into the script, so I'm doing it on the cuff. I'll, I'll just open it on my thing. Sorry. It's okay. Yeah, I didn't copy from my synopsis to the script. So, yeah. The last paragraph is... Um, Robert has an idea and asks Bub to draw a cathedral. As he draws, the blind man holds his hand over Bub's drawing hand. Bub becomes enwrapped in the exercise, and partway through, Robert asks him to close his eyes. He draws with his eyes closed, then Robert asks him to open his eyes and see his handiwork, but the narrator does not. He pretends to open them when, in fact, he keeps them closed. Wow. <clears throat> so, I have a question. Have you guys read Raymond Carver before? I've read you've read Raymond. Two. Yeah, you've read one. Mm -hmm. um, how did you guys feel about the story, just at a top level? For me, I wasn't, I wasn't enraptured with it. <laughs> how about for you, Annie? I loved it. Um, I loved it. Despite the fact it's not a typical Carver story, it's not what you think of when you think of Carver, and it's very traditional, but effective, right? Like it, it has all the things of a traditional story in it. There's no surprises. It's not experimental, and despite that, I just I loved it. You know, I, <clears throat> the reason why I asked if you guys had read Carver before is um, I've been reading Carver for the last two months. I've been working my way through his collection, um, where I'm calling from, and so far I've read 25 of his stories. And this story was one of his later stories that he wrote. It was his favorite story that he wrote. And it is a huge departure from his previous stories. But I feel like I, I couldn't read this story on its own because it was such like a culmination of what his other stories were working up to. And so I was very curious how you guys would read it if you hadn't read very many of his stories before. Because it is very different, but I felt like his previous stories were stepping, it was like a stairway to this story. And this story hit something that I felt like he'd been working to hit for a long time. And so for me, I love the story. But um, I love the story. And I, it's it's... It's a much more complex story than I initially thought as I read it, which is usual for Carver. And, you know, it definitely verified some ideas that I had as far as I personally like his longer stories better than his shorter stories. I like him when he gets in right around the 6,000 word range. Some of his super short stories, I can't stand them. And so uh, it, it definitely was an experience for me as I read it. Yeah, I, 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 
I, I, when I started reading it, I, I remembered or recognised that I, I had read it before. I, can't, I don't know when, and I don't remember what my opinion was of it when I read it first. But, but his his discussion of his wife's husband, um, and and previous husband confused me at the start. And mm -hmm. even when I read it again, I thought it's it's very unclear and it's not like it's you know subtly um subtly uh, introduced it's just confusing straight off the bat and which which, <laughs> which which bugged me and i didn't like the here we go i'm gonna get watch just, out for the lightning watch out for the it's lightning okay bolt the hate mail will come in your direction this time <laughs> yeah i'm sure oh, raven God. carver is gonna say hey, you, you know I, it's okay we yeah. we got it for hemingway he can get it for carver <laughs> i didn't like the way he wrote this it was it was breathless it was too staccato it was this to this to this to this to this and and I couldn't relax into the story. Um, and 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 there, there's other things as well. So actually, when we started like, this, I'm just going to start there. Because <laughs> when we started this podcast, that I was, thought, oh, I do you think that I was on purpose? I know I have my thoughts mm. on why it was written the way it was written. But do you think that was a conscious choice on Carver to write it in that just staccato manner and to keep you distant so that you couldn't relax into the story? Um, if it was, then I don't see why it was. Um, see, I think it was. Go on. Okay. I think it was because the character that we're following, he's insecure and he is not confident and he's feeling threatened by the relationship that the blind man has with his wife. And I feel like that staccato, the, the way it's written, puts you off kilter in a way similar to, to what he's feeling. And so for me, it, him, that distance and that discomfort as you're reading it is part of the experience. You're shaking your head at me. Yeah. Well, I, I just want to come in because I'm kind of like in between you guys. So I'm, it's like it's like a three-way lock horn thing here. Because okay. that just sounded dirty. It is. <laughs> <laughs> I, I like you know, like bulls when they go head to head. That's what I meant. But, so you anyway, know what? That's not so, helping. It's not helping. Yeah. No. Move on. So <laughs> not to see here. For me, the language was very. Um, it, it, I didn't think it was distant at all. I thought it was kind of like conversation. I felt like the narrator is telling me the story as if I'm their friend and I'm supposed to agree with him because he's so hip, he's so funny. Like all, a lot, the most staccato phrases were jokes. Like when he's like, a beard on a blind man, too much I say. Like this guy is like, he's kind of like this, he's kind of like a hip, I don't want to say charlatan. He thinks, he thinks he's cool. He thinks he's cool. He thinks he's a nineteen fifties cool. version of a hipster. Yeah. He's so <laughs> the original. Cool. And he assumes you agree that he's cool. But it I that didn't make it distant for me. Distant maybe in the sense that those type of people tend to have up a facade, but not distant in the sense that I think the author wants me to be uh, removed from the story. I think that's just the nature of the character. And mm -hmm. Maya, I don't agree that he's threatened by the blind man. I saw it a little differently because I didn't see him as being threatened by the blind man as much as being threatened by the relationship. Yeah, the relationship. With the blind man. Yeah. Yeah, not that he thinks the wife's gonna run off with the blind man, but no, that the no. blind man's closer to his wife. But like, the thing is, he. I'm not sure if that's necessarily the case because I think he's just he doesn't want to be inconvenienced. The idea of having to deal with somebody that you don't understand, who's blind, a disability that you don't know how to behave around, was like it's like a huge it's like putting him out. It's like a huge imposition for him, uh, more than anything else, because he never had any interest in this guy. He didn't even know the blind man's, um, you know, late wife's name. Didn't know any of the stories that the guy ended up telling about all the stuff he used to do when he says he's a regular blind jack of all trades. When he starts learning all the stuff that he's done throughout his life, like he never had any interest in any of this. See, for me, his his discomfort with the blind man in their relationship is really obvious, and part of it may be because I've read so much Raymond Carver. Like this is a constant theme of Raymond Carver, and this is the first story where it's actually come to a somewhat 
where it's come to a resolution. Like there's a constant theme throughout his stories of men that are insecure and that are dealing with insecurities, that are dealing with jealousy, that are dealing with infidelity. It's just his freaking thing. It's like Stephen King's drunk dad, you know. There's always one in every book. And that's Raymond Carver and his jealous, insecure men. And this was the first story where at the end of the story, the guy was no longer, the guy came to some sense of peace. And that's what I meant by the stair-stepping and the feeling that this was a culmination story. Now, reading Carver, I have to read it really close because he's very subtle in, in a lot of the things that are undercurrents in his story. And as I'm reading it, I get a really strong sense that he is very uncomfortable with how close he, his wife is to this man and the fact that he's not that close to his wife. Um, and it's in little things like how much attention is spent to noticing not just that the man doesn't walk with a cane. He never says, I thought all men walk with canes. He's noticing that his wife is holding him, that his wife is guiding him. His wife sits between them. His wife pays him more attention. His wife, when they're talking and they're talking about all their experiences, his wife never says, and then she, I met my wonderful husband. Like These are all things that are peppered throughout the story. And Raymond Carver does that. He's not going to be like, I'm a jealous man. He's not going to say it like that. And so I really got that sense that there was not only discomfort with that, but just discomfort in general. Like this character doesn't really assess his life doesn't really talk about his life he just is and that also would make him feel uncomfortable with the relationship between the blind man and his wife because they talk about life that's what they do they send tapes back and forth to each other and and so you know to me that's like the whole point of the story but I don't know if you would get that if you hadn't read a ton of Raymond Carver and I guess that's my question is you know, to someone who hasn't read a ton of Raymond Carver, it's obvious that, you know, some of that didn't catch because it was just too freaking subtle. Or, or just, yeah, and not subtle or just for me not, like, I guess uh, there were other elements that were stronger. So, yeah, like the whole thing where he, he notices that she doesn't mention, and that's when I met my wonderful husband. But, like, he also knows, because earlier, since he's also saying she sent a tape when we met about how we met in our relationship. So... Actually, now that I think about it being in a relationship, it's a little bit like when my boyfriend knows that I have those one or two people that are like my diaries that I tell everything to, including the, the relationship. And I guess I might be projecting my own experience because with him, it isn't that he feels like I'm closer to them and he's jealous of that. But then again, see, he's not Carver. He's extremely confident. But, um, uh, but it's more like a... Um, he just froze. Oh, did I just freeze for everyone? No. Yeah. Well, you froze for me. No one's froze. So okay. I don't know what you said. Okay. So what I was, I'll just repeat it. So what I was saying was, in my experience, because I have like two friends that are basically like my diaries, and it isn't that my boyfriend is jealous about how close I am to them, but again, he's a different kind of person. He's very confident. He's not like this protagonist who's insecure. But the way that I read it was more like in my experience, where my boyfriend's just more uncomfortable sometimes with the idea that there's somebody or two people out there who know so much about him, the relationship, and he allows it, and he's not jealous, but just kind of this discomfort of, here's this person who, like, knows everything. Here's the diary in person, you know? And I guess that's, I read that from my own experience into this. He's more uncomfortable that the blind man knows so much about him, this person he never met, because there's that line when he's listening to the tape, and he's talking about the husband, the blind man on the tape that they send back and forth. How do um, you feel about it, Gerald? Well, um... <clears throat> I, th I the, the point where where you said that that the you know, various things are, are peppered subtly through the story, I I thought it was anything but subtle. I thought as as soon as as soon as he sort of introduced the fact that you know, there's a blind man da 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 and and he started pr projecting some of his his um, uh, attitude towards this this blind person. Um, and I thought, I, I sort of knew then. I, thought, oh, I know what's going to happen. He's going to have a, you know, a, a sort of a, a discovery and and discover that actually the blind man's a real, real live person with real live 
you know feelings and experiences and all this sort of stuff so i i just thought he, so many times he 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 said he 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 dropped hints about or, or or basically said that that you know this guy is 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 um uh insecure and mm -hmm. this guy's insecure and this guy's insecure and I, just I felt like that's what the whole thing about the ex ex husband was, when he was talking about his wife's ex husband. I think that was him introducing the insecurity. Yeah, because there was that great line where it was like, "Why should he get a name? He's the he's the ex husband, the child, the childhood sweetheart. You don't even need to know his name, whatever." There were some there were some funny bits, and and you know, and and with with the 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 attitude of of this narrator guy of Bub. Um, you know he's he, and and also is, you know a little bit of racism comes into it. You know the, his the, the wife's name was Bueller and that's a black woman's name and and well it kind of is. <laughs> yeah, I've never met a white Bueller. <laughs> I'm sorry, I've been through the South, never met a white Bueller. <laughs> so I I just so that I I don't know I I got. And I read it a second time, and and it actually annoyed me even more. So, <laughs> you, you know like, what I, I think is like interesting is you you said that when you first read it, you felt like he was going to come to some resolution, which is funny because this is the first of Carver's stories where the character actually does. Most right. of his stories, they like just live in some crap hole, and it's just like a slight. <laughs> This was the first one that I read where I was like, "Oh, he had an epiphany." <laughs> Raymond Carver grows up. Yeah. <laughs> a narrator. <It's> a... <laughs> you know, because but you know what? As a writer, you know that a lot of those patterns that repeat throughout your story, they can tell you a lot about you. Yeah. You know, and <laughs> and so when I read this, I I kind of was smiling. I was like, "Oh, well, maybe Raymond Carver got Zoloff, and now he's happy." <laughs> and, and speaking of that epiphany, I think there was something about how like traditional about it it is. The main protagonist actually reaches a conclusive epiphany brought about with a twist of fate where like like an ironic twist against his prejudices. He has this kind of weird ignorance about blind men and then it's through a blind man's experience and guidance that he has this epiphany. I'm just like, it's like tale as old as time and yet so effective. Like it really worked for me. Even though it, there was something just like, this happens over and over and it's like, it's like literary crack. Like every time you're just like, mm, that, that worked you out. You know, how many stories have we read, movies that we've seen where it's the blind man is like the magical Negro, you know? He comes in, he can't see, and therefore he sees more than everybody else. It's <laughs> almost cliche exactly. at this point. Yeah. <laughs> and I recognize the story was, was published in what? 1980, something like that. But yeah. still, it, it is kind of cliched. And for it to be such a cliched idea and still be pulled off so well, I don't think I could have pulled off that story. I think it would have made myself puke and I wouldn't have done it as well. There's no way I could have pulled that off. And I just really admire that he took such like an old cliched idea and kind of made it really fresh. And I think one of the things that made it fresh for me is at the end of the story, when his wife is saying, what's going on? What's going on? And he's not telling her because he's experiencing this. And I felt like that's probably the exact reversal of how it's been throughout their entire relationship. She's had this relationship with this blind man, and she expresses all these emotions with him, but doesn't really let her husband into that circle and finally he's experiencing this and she's outside the circle and I think if it hadn't been for that little bit of bristling against it I think it would have come off way too saccharine and annoying. Mm. That's, a, that's a good point actually. I, yeah, that, that, I'd, I'd forgotten that, that bit uh, about her and, and about her being cut out of the experience that he was having with the blind man, and it's like, um, you know, a reversal because he felt left out of the relationship that she had with the blind man up to that point. So it, it's the whole sort of, yeah, the the epiphany, the the, the turnaround and the twist at, at the end. It's, um, and I thought it was very, it was very nicely done that that bit um, where he was guiding guiding his hand and 
um, you know, he kept his eyes closed, and and then you you sort of see he's he's experiencing more because he can't see, and and I thought that was that was that was very nicely done, even though it was fairly obvious. The, I, I want to build on what Maya was saying, where she said, um, you know, at the end the wife's cut out from this that she was always opening up to the blind man, but you said something uh. like that she doesn't really let, yeah. I, I'm just having problems with you cutting in and out. Can you kill yeah, your my video? Yeah. I thought it was me, but I think it might be you. Okay. So, um, so what I was saying was building on what Maya was saying about um, the wife getting cut out of sort of that experience with the blind man at the end, and earlier she was always emotionally intimate with the blind man and shut her husband out. I just want to dig into that a little deeper because. I don't think she shut the husband out. The husband just never cared because when she shared her poetry, he never cared about it. He, he belittles it, says it's not very good, pretty much. Um, he never takes an interest in this relationship she has with her closest friend, is what it sounds like. Um, and he, like, teases her, you know, like, playfully, but also about things that are important to her. Like, when she's... Um, boiling the potatoes or peeling the potatoes and he starts teasing her like, oh, maybe I'll take Robert, the blind man, bowling. And she's like, she gets mad at him because he's poking fun at something that he should know by now she's, you know, sensitive about. Um, so, so I thought that was interesting too. Yes, this jealousy, but any, you know, he doesn't make any effort to get close to her. Oh, but any jealous men do not act the same way that jealous women act. <laughs> no, no, I'm not faulting him. I'm not saying it wasn't convincing. I'm just saying. I'm just saying it ain't on her. She tried. He did it. <laughs> but we don't know that. You and your death to the authorness are going to be the death of me. <laughs> you know, there's a sense that, like, there's a sense to me in this story that. Yes, he's shut out, but I think it's inherent because she has known this man longer and he's never visited. Their entire relationship has been through these tapes that they send back and forth. So just by the nature of the relationship, he's excluded. And I don't think I think don't think him teasing and and him being a little bit of an idiot is is the cause of the distance. I think it is a symptom of the distance. I think that's how he deals with it. So for me, when I was reading it and I see him like bristling, I saw that as him being insecure and just trying to deal with the situation. I didn't see that as him not trying hard enough. Um, you know, and then when he does try, she's upset by it. Like, she's uncomfortable when he offers the blind man pot. And she's uncomfortable when she comes in, when she wakes up and they're doing the drawing on the paper. Like, when he does try to make a connection with the blind man, she literally gets between them. Wow, that's interesting because you say that him, you know, kind of like rejecting her poetry, not care. Because remember, she shares a tape with him of the blind man. It cuts out. He doesn't show any further interest. Um, you know, he was like relieved that it got cut out. You say that's a symptom, but to me, her behavior where she's like on edge during the whole visit, to me, that's the symptom because she doesn't trust him around the blind man because of all these things that have happened because of the teasing and the way that he is and she knows about his ignorance. For me, her being kind of on edge, maybe I'm just a, a woman's woman will tend to side with you like ninety percent of the time. Are you calling like, me a misogynist? I'm not calling you a misogynist. I just I think I think you give dumb men way too much credit here because um, I think you just called me a misogynist. <laughs> <laughs> I think Gerald's about ready to raise a red flag and just step out of the way and let us brawl. He seems to be enjoying yeah. this far too much. <laughs> yeah. You just carry on. I <laughs> poor <laughs> Gerald, poor yeah. poor Gerald. <laughs> I, I, I think I think if if um, I think it's only men who can be misogynists. I think women are missing. Mis no, mis I think we're just b words. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, See, really I self censored. <laughs> Don't say I never <laughs> try. <laughs> No, I don't think it's a matter of he's at fault or she's at fault. I think that this relationship has some inherent faults in it, and they are both contributing. You know, I'm not willing to say he's a bad husband and, and he does this and he does that. I see them both being not treating this relationship in a way that 
makes it easier for it to be part of their life. You know, I think that she's approaching it in a way that makes it difficult for him. I think he's dealing with it in a way that makes it difficult for her. I definitely think they're both, like, they have crappy communication, which mm. is, like, none of Carver's couples ever have decent communication. <laughs> <laughs> Not one of them, 26 <laughs> stories, and not one couple sits down and has a decent conversation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because I, I think, it, I think it's, it's like a... I don't know how long they've been together, this couple, but it's. I think it's quite like a lot of um, people of my age... Uh, you know, 40 plus a bit um, <laughs> but who, who've been in a relationship for, for a long time and, and once once the kids have left home assuming they have kids there's very little in common between the, the, the two parents between the two people and they don't have much conversation they don't spend a lot of time together they don't do the same sort of things together so um, I, I can as as I'm reading it and, and seeing how the you know how how their relationship is unfolded to to the reader, I I can see yeah you know that he's he doesn't like he her close relationship to Robert, um, and he doesn't feel the need you know for it and he doesn't want to be uh, he doesn't really want he I think he would have rather gone gone down the bar and and uh, and mm -hmm. you know, left them alone but. Um, uh, but but yeah that but that was when when you can see when she when she wakes up and they're doing this drawing she she wants to know what's going on she she feels left out she feels excluded um, and probably because it's it's her friend you know she she's maybe she's maybe she's sort of jealously guarded this this friendship this this close friendship with with the blind guy. Yeah, I think that was her thing that's hers. Mm. You know? Um, and I like how you compared that to the couples that have been together for a really long time and they've spent like, you know, 20 some odd years focusing on the kids and the kids leave and they're like, who are you? I have nothing in common with you. I don't know who you are. You know? And yeah. I definitely got the sense that this was a very special friendship to her and that it was her relationship. It was hers. It wasn't something she wanted to share. And that's why I say that I don't see, I see his reaction and him being a little rough around the edges about it as coping mechanism because the way she acts tells me that this was not something she wanted to share with her husband. You know, almost, mm. it's almost like emotional cheating. You know, girls are always like, it's not the physical cheating, it's the emotional cheating. <laughs> and this is what they're talking about. Because she is so emotionally involved in this relationship in a way that she isn't in her own marriage. And if, it, if the tables had been turned and he had a female friend that he was this emotionally close to while being distant to the wife, I think we would all approach this story with a very different point of view. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Including Anna East. <laughs> Maybe. I mean, if he was older and blind and living across the country. He's not that much older. He's in his 40s. He's like 42. He just seems older because he's wise and blind. You know, magical negroness makes you seem unaged. Whatever. <laughs> Phrase, magical Negro. <laughs> oh, right. it's such like an academic phrase, and I love that phrase. I just love yeah. that every once in a while, I, I, I ca the academics, the academics just nail something so perfectly. You know, he is that other that comes in to teach the lesson, which mm. in essence always makes them seem ageless. It doesn't matter. And you, do you know where the phrase comes from, Gerald? Or no. is it an Americanism? Then it's an Americanism. Um, the idea of the magical Negro comes from the constant... It's, it's a trope in movies and books, but specifically movies. For a long, long time, the only black characters you would see, their whole purpose in the movie was to impart some wisdom on the main Caucasian character. So that was the maid in Gone with the Wind. It was the Indian guy in Dances with Wolves. It was the, um, 
short, um, vertically challenged woman in in um, Poltergeist. They're always they're an other, and it's kind of it was originally just pertaining to black people, but I see it across the board for any kind of other. There, you're always seeing somebody who is a minority group that comes into the film f to help the Caucasian character who's clueless learn some important life lesson, but that's their only point in the film. And it's kind of annoying when you see that 30 movies in a row when you're, you know, in middle school and there's literally no other black characters. And so that's where the film, that's where the term came from. And it's been like really prominent when black people first came into the movies, when they f actually first were allowed on screen. A lot of those first roles were strictly magical Negro roles. And so, you know, it, it's an old trope. And I see, while he's not black, he's playing that role. He is an other. And because of his otherness, he is imparted with wisdom. Mm. that he has to deliver to this character. And it's kind of annoying, but it's done well, so I can't be too mad. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and would, di di we're digressing off the story here, but it, would, would Obi-Wan Kenobi be, be that sort of character as well? Because that's his only role is, is to impart knowledge to... Uh, no, Ruby. he is the mentor. He's considered the mentor. It's a different trope where you oh, have the okay. mentor that teaches you and then the mentor has to die so that the hero can become the hero. That's a right. whole other trope. Uh -huh. <laughs> Very good. I've learned but Yoda maybe could be a weird one, possibly. <sighs> maybe. It, it's, a, it's a tough one because he has to be... He has to not only be of minority status, but of status that is of lower status. Yeah, so plus, because it, of their status, they have to be considered less than in some way. Right. It doesn't really matter when it's a green, wrinkled up, you know, alien. It matters. Yeah, no one was racist people. against Yoda. Right. Right. It's it, it's different <laughs> when you're representing actual people. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I just uh, I'm still not convinced that it's on her, but it's fine. We need to move on. Um, <laughs> <laughs> bad Maya, bad, bad, right. bad. No, I'm just saying. Well, she shared the tape, but again, uh, maybe it's just because it's going to talk about him that time. So, um, but I wanted to get to the character because this was something else that really impressed me about Carver, Carver as an author is that he takes this character who, on paper, like if you were to write down like his main traits, he's not likable. Like he's really obnoxious. He's insecure. He thinks he's hip when he's not. He's cynical. Um, he, he's got all these prejudices against the blind, the racism which we mentioned, and yet, despite that, you like him. He makes him likable, in some parts even endearing, because it's just, I guess, the skill of the author. I'm not exactly sure at what point I decided I really like this guy, but I did. You know, that reminds me of, did you guys of the podcast writing excuses they were talking about this idea of there being character traits in a slider in order to make the reader feel empathy for a character so you could have mm -hmm. somebody that was obnoxious but they had to have some other trait to balance it or else we would hate the character mm -hmm. so like if someone's obnoxious they have to be competent if someone is insecure they have to have they have to be kind that there has to be a balance and I don't think Carver adheres to those rules. Like, you're right. He has a lot of negative traits. But, again, we like him. At least I did. Gerald didn't. Um, nope. For me, I liked him because I saw that he was trying. I saw that he was really uncomfortable, but he was trying to be respectful. And, and that caused me to empathize with him because he was so uncomfortable. But also, I liked him because, you know, he seems like a normal guy. He does not like perfect, and he's not all bad. He's just a guy. And I don't, I think Carver does just normal people really, really well. Like, there's nothing extraordinary about this guy. He's not a hero. He's not super smart. He's not amazing. He's not a villain. He's just a guy. Mm. And I would add, Oh, just one thing. I agree with all of that, that he tries and he's normal. And also he's funny. At least he's funny. Mm. You found him funny. I, I Most of his jokes fell flat for me. <laughs> yeah, me too. And, and, and I've been 
I didn't find anything likable about him. And uh, yes, he he was he tried to be respectful, but but by that time, I suppose that's that's the skill of the writer because I'd made my mind up that I didn't like him, and the fact that I I just felt awkward for him because. Uh, awkward for the, them, the, all three of them, in mm-hmm. that situation, because he 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 didn't really welcome the Robert into their their home. He didn't really, you know, he, he you you could almost sense the the animosity he felt towards Robert. Um, so so yeah, so uh, I uh, yeah I didn't like him. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm being negative tonight, sorry. But you know what? I think that's fine because Carver, nobody feels okay about Carver. He's one of those writers that people either love him or hate him. But he made significant changes in short stories. Like short stories before Carver and short stories after Carver are a very different thing. Like a lot of the things that we see in modern short stories are directly influenced by Raymond Carver. Mm-hmm. And so I think that that is worth something, you know. Even, like, if you have a story that you just dislike that much and you still finished it, I still consider that a good story because it caused you to have a really strong emotion. Like, you did not like this guy. You did not like this story. If it was a bad story, you would be ambivalent and just not freaking care. Yeah, oh, it, it's, you know, there's no bad art, is there? It is, well, there is, but... but there is. Um, it's the art that you don't care. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So... Yeah, art, art that you dislike is is still good art. Um, so if it's a yeah, strong it, dislike, it was, yeah. 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 It's okay, Gerald. Next <laughs> week you'll have a story you like, maybe. <laughs> I <hope so. laughs> maybe I doubt it though. Okay. Well, we know why Gerald had issues with the story. Mm-hmm. What issues did you have with the story? Well, before I get there, I just want to bring up one more thing that I noticed that this is, again, hats off to Carver, just real quick, is um, when he says um, the whole thing about his wife writing one or two poems a year and that he never picks up poetry, that he's, that he's not into that, I thought it was really fitting that then later he couldn't describe the cathedral poetically. He couldn't describe it in words, and he was much more connected to it when he was drawing it. I thought that was really cool, that shift in expression away from words, especially because this guy's very verbose. That's why he's always Mm -hmm. cracking jokes and teasing. And then taking it to drawing, another way of communication or another way of seeing and feeling, I really like that. I didn't catch the first read through, and the second one, I was like, hmm, clever author. Yeah. That's a good catch. Yeah, I, I definitely agree with you on that. Yeah. So things I didn't like about it, um, I don't really have one. I can't think of anything that I didn't like about it other than, okay, but it's not really a dislike for the reasons we said. We we talked about how it's a little cliche to have the magical blind guy come through. And I, it's funny because even though I knew he can't be black, the blind man, because if he was, the author would have remarked on it, cause mm-hmm. the way he remarked about the, the wife's name. He's still, by the end of the story, I still pictured him black, and it might be because of this, like, magical character <laughs> Great, he has going on. <laughs> You've been so brainwashed by yeah. U.S. movies that you just expect it. Yeah. That's funny. That is yeah. funny. Well, he, he, he couldn't be black because when he says Beulah is, is, is his wife black, the wife is the one who's appalled by the suggestion that she might be black. And if he was black, there wouldn't have been any reason to be appalled. So... Mm. You know, the, like, like he wasn't the one that said that there was anything wrong if she'd been black. He asked, is she black? And the wife was the one that's, what's wrong with you? Are you crazy? Oh, I, I think that's so different. I didn't see it as the wife being appalled that he would think that Robert married a black woman. I saw it as the wife being like, why does it matter? Why are you focusing on this? Mm. This was, this is what, written in the 80s, and it seems like it's set before that, I think the exact line is, was his wife a Negro? That is 1960s language. That is not 1980s language. And in 1960s, that would have been a big deal. Um, so as what, what's the, um, he says, um, was his wife a Negro, I asked. Are you crazy, my wife said. Have you just flipped or something? She picked up a potato. I saw it hit the floor, then roll under the stove. What's wrong with you, she said. Are you drunk? I'm just asking, I said. 
Yeah, I, it could really be read either way. And you're, you, you're probably closer to the truth, to be honest, because I'm probably reading it very like liberal, modern, and he's perspective where I'm just like, why would you even <laughs> ask such a thing? But it's, po yeah. Yeah. but it's possible you're closer to the truth. <laughs> <laughs> That's just because I've been reading 26 stories of Raymond Carver yeah. back to back. Like. <laughs> But also, I think the language sets the place. I think that's something he does really well. Um, I like stories where no one has to sit and tell me, this happened in the 1980s, this happened in the 1990s. I can glean it from the language and the dress and the way people are relating to each other. I really like that, and I feel like this story probably does that better than any of his other stories as far as just immediately setting a place. Because a lot of times, you know, you read a story and you're like, when is this happening? I didn't get any of that when I was reading this. Like, it just was very visual for me. Mm. Yeah. So, looking at that moment again. So, yeah, I agree with what you're saying that he's not spelling out for you the time or the place. And you kind of just have to infer what the wife meant. But it's also fascinating that over time, like, I'm sure when this story was published with the people, you know, for, for, for his contemporaries at the time, it was very clear what she meant by, are you crazy? And over time, it's kind of changing, right? Well, I mean, the story was published in, in 81, I think. Yeah, I mean, you have to know that. that long ago. It you wasn't published that. that long ago. Yeah. yeah. All I'm saying is that people reading it wouldn't have been that different from people reading it now. If anything, they would have been a little more liberal about it. I feel like we've gotten more uptight over time. <laughs> <laughs> Gerald's chuckling. You've seen us on the news. You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Look at him appeasing, appeasing his American listeners. No wonder he's the one with the fan club. <laughs> Where's my fan club, man? Where's my marriage proposal? <laughs> yeah, you're not living that down. <laughs> You know, for me, again, I honestly, I I feel really biased. I feel biased reading the story because I've read so many of his other stories and I know it's affecting me. And so at this point, I kind of feel like I just want to hear you guys talk about it as, as readers because I feel like most of our listeners are probably going to come at it closer to you guys than to me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but yeah. but then but then we're at opposite ends of the spectrum, aren't we? Really, but uh, but I, yeah, I I I I suspect I'm going to be in the minority on this one. Um, you know, Carver is 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 an amazing writer, is a fantastic writer, but this story just didn't. You know, it, it seemed, as I said, it seemed all it seemed rather obvious. It seemed a bit of a cliche, um, and I you know I didn't like the 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 main character. Um, you know, he he was. I I, I I don't like. I perhaps because I'm trying too hard to be a modern liberal. That I don't like people who have um, who have these preconceived notions and and um, you know, prejudices. And and maybe maybe from my perspective, as soon as a character comes before me that's like that, perhaps I just I just take an instant dislike to them. Maybe that's that's, that's interesting. My problem. Mm. See, that is really interesting because I know that I'm not like that at all, and I know that there are a lot of stories that I enjoy that a lot of people don't just because I I'm. I'm really open to reading about people I don't like or don't understand. Like, it, I don't have that instant turn-off that a lot of people have. I think most people are like that. I think most people, if they start to read a story and they really dislike the main character, it just turns them off. Mm. And I don't know what that is. I don't know if it's because I've spent my whole life not f as an observer, so it makes it easier for me to just observe and set aside my preconceived notions. Like, I can read a story about... You know, the KKK, and I will literally just read the story. Um, and, and I don't know whether that's good, whether I'm missing out on some things with the story. You know, like, how do you guys feel about reading a body of work versus just an individual story? Because this is the first time where I've honestly read a body of work. And I'm noticing it completely changes my reading experience. And now I'm looking back on some other stories and I'm wondering, might I have enjoyed them on a different level if I had a better understanding of the author's previous work? 
Well, I, th I think that's what happened with the Murakami story. Recall I was the one who liked it the most, and I'm the one who's read almost all of Murakami's works. So I think I came into it kind of like understanding what certain things meant already because I'd already been trained by the author, to put it that way. How do you feel about that, Gerald? Are you a body of work reader or are you an individual reader? No, I, I, I'm an individual reader and, and I, I think I, I think I, I come from the perspective that, that a, a short story should stand on its own and should should work as a single piece um, and I don't think you should I I can't imagine me reading a body of work and that changing how how I view the individual pieces yeah uh, I'm, I'm I, I don't I, think. I don't I don't know. I'm like, is it changing mm. how I'm seeing the piece, or is it just allowing me to go deeper into the piece? I'm not sure what that is, because I can. I feel like the more when I first started reading Carver, I felt like I had to put in more work as a reader, and now I'm noticing that I'm getting details without putting in as much work. Does that make sense? Mm. Yeah, I think so. You know, and it's making me kind of interested in reading more from some of the authors that we've already read just because I want to see, will I get more out of them? Like, if I read a, a bunch of Adeshi stories, am I going to pull more out of those stories than I initially saw? And, and that's the question I'm having with myself right now, and it's an interesting one. Yeah, though I'll say I, I read Purple Hibiscus before we read Birdsong for the podcast, and I don't know that reading Purple Hibiscus in any way informed the way that I read Birdsong. So I think it might depend on the author. I think maybe some authors are more idiosyncratic with the things that they put in their stories over and over, and others I also aren't. think short stories and novels, I don't think they cross over. I think most authors that write both short stories and novels, I think... While there may be some similar themes, I feel like short stories, they're so short and you have to put so much into such tiny, tiny sense of words. Like, when I compare novels to short stories, I'm starting to come to the conclusion that short stories are actually the pin pinnacle of writing. Like, novels... The, uh, most novels, there are at least some places that are bloated. There are places that really don't need to be there. And I feel like short stories so compact, you have to have a really high skill level to pull it off. And part of that ends up in the process. I feel like there may be perhaps more of the author in those short stories that gets carried from one short story to another. So, you know, in, you're going to work through your own crap as you're writing short story after short story <laughs> just because <laughs> you're writing more of them, I feel like. I wonder, just, just throwing it out there live instead of in a meeting, what if we did like um, a month where we did four short stories by the same author and see if in the last episode we noticed something just because we had read the other three? Could be a fun experiment. That would be a really interesting experiment. I, I you know, we would have to maybe do a poll of, of our super fans and see if there's an author in particular that they would like us to address. Maybe an author that's really challenging would be perfect for something like that. Yeah. So listeners, yeah. let us know. <laughs> yeah. I think that would be a really interesting experiment, you know, because I'm very curious. This, this was really my first example of, because I'm not a series reader. I don't read series um, until Literary Roadhouse, I wasn't a heavy short story reader. So this is really my first experience of having read a large no body of work by one writer. Mm -hmm. And I'm and it's a very different experience for me. And it's one that I'm enjoying, quite frankly. Like I really enjoyed this story. Yeah. And I felt like I got it with such little amount of work compared to when I first started reading his work. Mm -hmm. Should we read it then? How about you, Gerald? Do you want to rate this puppy? Do you want to guess what Gerald's going to do? Do you want to, like, write down what you think Gerald's guess is going to be and then, like, see if we're right? Yeah, I, think, I think Gerald wants to give it a one, but, he, but he's like, but I can't because it's Carver, so maybe, like, a two or two and a half. 
<laughs> he's probably like, oh, if I give it the, my real rating, then I'm going to get hate mail, and then no one's going to like me anymore, so I have to pat it. You know, it's like when a girl says, do, how much, how old do you think I am? And you're like, well, she oh, really Lord. looks 40, but I'm going to say 35. <laughs> 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 oh, yes. yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, no, no, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm honest, and, and I, I will tell you what I think, and I'll rate as I feel, and I'll give it a three. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's, it's, you know, it was, it was, I thought it was pretty well written, well constructed. I liked the ending. I thought that was well done. Um, but yeah, the the rest of it fell pretty flat for me. So yeah, I think three is a is a, a good a good score. Okay. And for me, I'm giving it a five and a half. I think no. that it. Yeah, I know. Talk about different. I felt like it was a really good story, and it, and it resolved a question that had been going through many of his previous stories. Um, but at the same time, it wasn't my favorite story. Like, there are a few stories that when I read them, they literally take my breath away, and, you know, that give me a six. You know, I, I can think of two stories off the top of my head that Carver's written that I would rate sixes. But it doesn't quite do that. But I feel like there's something very amazing about having a question or, or an experience that you've been working through multiple stories and then you finally write the story that finally resolves it. And that was something I hadn't expected and I loved it. It was also... Um, one of the stories that came out after he broke up with his editor. So, you know, it's pure Carver, in a sense. Mm -hmm. um, for me, it's also a five and a half. I, I wanted to give it a six, but I think I only want to give it a six because I don't have a six yet. But th it's a five and a half because, it, it again, it isn't like I the skies opened up and the angels sang, as we say. But... Mm -hmm. um, but I just, I really, even though there were some things that were kind of cliche about it, he made them fresh. The voice, I really enjoyed that the voice wasn't like exploitative. You know how some short stories, the voice is like, mm -hmm. feel the emotions with me. You know, like you can feel the author. <laughs> yeah. That's how I like that feeling yet. Yeah. <laughs> and there's something about that voice that like, I'll give it a pass, but I don't enjoy it. I like that this wasn't doing that. So, five and a half. Okay. Wow. Yeah, everybody liked it but you, Gerald. <laughs> oh, we'll see what the what the listeners think. <laughs> you know what, Gerald? You're not alone. There are so many people that cannot stand Raymond Carver, so you're in good company. <laughs> well, not necessarily good company, just just company. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so what did we rate? What did our listeners rate last week's story? There is a nice conversation going on over there. Yes, yes. This is probably one of my favorite recent discussions we're having on the website. People should go and read that right now. Um, but listeners gave Safe Somewhere by Baird Harper 3.75 Bradberries. Okie okay, dokie. Okay. Mm -hmm. And they're wrong too. <laughs> Poor You're Gerald. Wrong. Everyone's wrong. Yeah. <laughs> Everyone's <laughs> wrong but Gerald. Get off my lawn. <laughs> one of these days I'll find some people who are right. One of these days, I'm going to have a mixer. I'm going to have like a special theme song of you saying, get off my lawn. I'm just going to play it for you. <laughs> You're wrong. So what, what, what are we submitting for next week's story? Oh, well, I, I'm going to submit... Ooh, where is it? Um, I'm going to submit The Empty Family by Colm Toybin. I'm probably pronouncing that wrong. Interesting. I haven't heard of this. Where is this published? I'm very curious. It's This is on the um, newspaper website, the Guardian website. Um, oh, I love that your guys' newspaper publishes short stories. That just makes me so happy. Oh. <sighs> it makes me happy. Short story lives. It's alive! <laughs> um, you know, I've got two short stories here, and I, I keep alternating between the two. Um, but I am going to submit Embassy of Cambodia by Zadie Smith. Oh, okay. okay. 
Excellent. So the game we're playing is about famous blind people, or they may not be totally blind, but in some oh, way God. impaired. You yeah. know what? You and your darn trivia, man. Ah, oh, no wonder I never get my stories. I'm so bad at trivia. So bad. <laughs> <Can I? laughs> okay. Okay. Go for it. So I'm gonna give you a clue. I'm just say Helen Keller for everything. That's all. <laughs> Helen Keller is not one of the answers, so already just know that. I can't say Helen Keller. Why, why did you say Helen Keller is not one of the answers? It's like, the, come on. I'm just helping now. you out here. I'm just helping you out. Okay. okay. So I'm gonna give you the clue, and you're gonna give me the famous person. Maya first. Great. You, you can do this. Yeah. It's a world famous tenor who sings "Time to Say Goodbye" with Sarah Brightman and "The Prayer" with Celine Dion. Helen Keller. <laughs> I say Amazing face. tenor. <laughs> I couldn't even say it with a straight face. Oh, God. Um, I have no idea. I'm sorry. I have no Don't idea. just come up with the first singer that pops into your head. Who is in Pavarotti? They all... <laughs> Thank you. Oh, very white. <laughs> no. Um... um um, I, oh God! <laughs> Why are you doing this to me, Eddie? I'm so bad with names. I don't know that many blind na people that are <laughs> singers. All I can think is braids and kind of dancing in at the at the piano and freaking. I'm black and I'm totally losing my black card here. It's all your fault, Annie. <laughs> well, well uh, no, not. Can you steal the black card? I love this. Sure. <laughs> so great. You guys either. steal it's the black card. Just, just make me make it worse. <laughs> Andrea Bocelli. Yes, Andrea Bocelli. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna send you Maya the Prayer with Celine Dion, and you're gonna belt it at home because that's what that song is. For. I don't actually know that song. It's probably. I don't movie. think I've ever heard it. <laughs> okay, I'm not gonna try singing it right now, but. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? This is something I really want to hear. <laughs> okay, Gerald. Yes. An impressionist artist whose best known work is called Water Lilies. He was blind? Mm hmm. Well, kind of, going blind. He still worked through the last bit of it. Uh, it. Oh, crikey. Um. Is it Monet? Yes. Ooh. Okay, Maya. Yeah. Freedom fighter and underground railroad conductor. Harriet Tubman? Yep. Now we know. She was almost. I cold. did not know. Yeah, I know. Learn something new every day. <laughs> Gerald, yep. the singer of I've Got a Woman, Hit the Road Jack, and Georgia on My Mind. Really? Really. <laughs> Um, t -t 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 -t. Hit the road, Jack. And don't you come back no more, no more, no more, no more. Hit the road, Jack. And don't you come back no more. What you say? <laughs> is, is it Ray Charles? It is. Ooh. Mm. That was a guess. Yep. Maya, author of Paradise Lost. All I can think is Dante. <laughs> I'm lost. I'm lost. No. I'm so bad with names. <laughs> so bad. <laughs> Sorry, I pass. <laughs> Gerald? Um. <laughs> it's not just me, um, thank God. I've got it sitting yeah. on my freaking bookshelf. <laughs> is it... Is it Milton? It is Milton. It Milton. is Milton. Last minute guesses. No. He's just good with names. Mm -hmm. yeah, weird. Should we keep going or end it here? I have just give one. it to Gerald. Nope. Let's give it to just Gerald. Put me out of my misery already. <laughs> one, one. Shoot me. I am like, I've been watching Naked and Afraid all week, and I am one of those snakes that's been pinned saying, cut my head off already. I promise my next game will then just be like, dumb luck.
<laughs> what would enemies do? What number are you thinking of? Yeah. <laughs> okay, so Gerald, what are we reading? We are reading The Empty Family by Carl Toybin, and I will find out how to pronounce his name before next time. But I think that's, that's how it is. Carl Toybin. Okay, well, but before you read that, tell us what you thought about Cathedral. Specifically, have you heard the stereotype that blind people don't smoke? I need to know if this is a real thing. <laughs> But you can also tell us anything you want by joining the discussion at literaryroadhouse.com. While you're at it, leave an iTunes, Stitcher, or Spreaker review. But most important of all, don't forget to tell your friends. Until next time, read a good story. I'm so glad you brought that up because what the world was this blind that? people don't smoke because they can't see the smoke <laughs> business. <laughs> it was the most ludicrous thing I'd ever read in my life. Oh my goodness. You five and a half. <laughs> I did, but it was funny, and it, I didn't. I gave it oh, five and a half, not right. because that was ludic, not because it was ludicrous, but because it fit his character. But my goodness, did Wait, people gonna, actually think that? <laughs> hold on, I'm gonna do blind people don't smoke. Yes, Google it now. I'm not taking this off broadcast because it, important listeners need to know the answer to There's whether or not this Times is a real stereotype. About this. Really? <laughs> yes. <laughs> You've got to be kidding me. <laughs> okay, please leave this live because this is getting a little ridiculous right now. <laughs> Headline. Okay, this is, when is this from? It's from Probably like 1948. 18, 1884. 1884. <laughs> Headline. Mistakes about the blind. The belief that they don't enjoy smoking, unfounded. <laughs> <laughs> the belief that blind people don't care about smoking as all is nonsense is William Chapin, the principal of the Pennsylvania Institution for the Instruction of the Blind. <laughs> okay. Oh my god, that is so funny! <laughs> I'm glad the New York Times is addressing this in 1884. <laughs> on, on, on the other hand, from 2008, so it's well up to date, from The Guardian again, uh, it says smoking can blind you, say doctors. There you go. Oh, so then blind <laughs> people should especially smoke because they don't have to worry about that. <laughs> <laughs> Just oh, the lungs. <laughs> oh, my head, my head. <laughs> Just the cancer. <laughs> oh, and this is going in the outtakes. <laughs> yeah. I think totally. you should put it for our audio listeners. They need to know. Oh, my gosh, this is hysterical. <laughs> I love you guys. <laughs> <laughs>